Welcome back to the 6Ps podcast and today's episode is going to focus on background information that you need to know when it comes to Alfred Hitchcock's film Rear Window. So let's have a look at some of the basics and this is information that you really need to know when it comes to this film. Today you're going to be provided with a bit of a snapshot on these aspects but I definitely encourage you all to go out there and undertake your own research. So today we'll have a look at Alfred Hitchcock about America post-World War II, a little bit about McCarthyism, voyeurism and the Cold War, and gender roles as well. So why is this important to know? Well, in order to fully understand a text, it is absolutely imperative that you have a strong grasp of the social, cultural and historical context of the film. Because not only will you be able to call upon this knowledge in your essays, but it does play an important role in terms of meeting the criteria in the sack in particular, where you need to show an understanding of the worlds of the text. So let's learn a little bit about Alfred Hitchcock, who directed over 50 feature films, but a lot of other shows and, and, and short films as well. He is known as the master of suspense, and he absolutely dominated this genre throughout the 50s and 60s of what is known as, as, as the golden period of Hollywood. Other than Rear Window, you might be quite familiar with films like Psycho, Birds, North by Northwest, and Vertigo, but there are so many more. But these films still stand up today and are studied still today at universities and schools as we are doing with Rear Window. Alfred Hitchcock, as well as being known for being the master of suspense, he was also known for providing audiences with the characters' perspectives through camera angles and shots. And this is particularly relevant for Rear Window where we share L.B. Jeffrey's perspective throughout most, if not all, of the film, or the majority of the film anyway. What L.B. Jeffrey sees is what we see. So we gain more of a greater understanding in terms of his beliefs, values, and opinions. But Hitchcock was definitely known for experimenting with the camera. Um, another example, I guess, is the cool shop effect, which we'll look at a little bit late, later on. But the sequence of shots, which, you know, we see the characters face, we look at what they're seeing, and then we get another close-up of their reaction. So we know how they've interpreted whatever it is they're seeing. And again, he was really well known for experimenting with the camera. When it comes to the question, what is Rear Window about? I go with the fact that Rear Window highlights the complexities of voyeurism. And we'll touch on voyeurism a little bit later on. But but Hitchcock is particularly interested in in getting the audience to question the morality behind voyeurism and whether it's the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do. And we'll touch on that a little bit later on. So let's have a look at America post-World War II. And of course, America were, I guess, successful in World War II, if you want to say that. They, they sort of won the war. Um, they didn't actually want a bar of it to begin with and initially, of course, following World War I and the Great Depression. Um, they sort of felt the effects of that, but following Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor, they were sort of sparked um, into it. And as the war moved into the Pacific, they obviously had many battles with Japan, as did, 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 did their allies. So things like the Battle of Midway, um, the Battle of the Coral Sea, Kikoa Track all played an important role in America eventually crippling the Japanese army into surrender. They, of course, played a role in the end of World War II, of course, in Europe as well. They played a or had a major role in the D-Day landings as well. But America actually posh prospered following World War II, and consumerism increased quite dramatically. And we see that with L.B. Jeffries, who mentions or references, you know, the laundry of the auto automatic dishwasher and... This is in stark contrast to Europe, which was crippled both physically and economically following the war. Men returned home after the war as well and came back into the workforce. Of course, women played a significant role in the war efforts in America. They were working in the factories, producing weapons and ammunition, as well as clothing, medical supplies. And following the war, they had to sort of return back to their domestic duties. And we'll touch on that a little bit later on as well. But following World War II, a new enemy emerged. It was the Soviet Union, the USSR, and communism. And following World War II, there was another war, 
which was an ideological war, and that was the Cold War. This was essentially, I guess, democracy versus communism, to break it down quite simply. And within that, there were many other wars, like the Korean War and the Vietnam War, where allies of America and Russia um, opposed each other. America were particularly fearful of communism, and the reason they got involved within these wars was because of the domino effect. You might have heard of that before, where they felt that if one country fell to communism, so many more would, and eventually it would dominate the world, and they were definitely against that. Which leads nicely into this idea of McCarthyism. So, Senator Joseph McCarthy, as I said, was a senator. He was quite prominent in America, and he was definitely influential in the spread of the fear of communism that pervaded American society, particularly during the 1950s. It's also known as the Red Scare. McCarthyism is the practice of making accusations of subversion or treason without evidence. And this is really important. It's the fact that individuals could be accused without actually proper evidence being used against them. This is particularly used towards individuals that were considered to be either communists or communist sympathizers. And as a result of this, the American government actually encouraged the citizens to spy on the neighbors and report suspicious behavior, even if they didn't have evidence. And this is where we see the idea of voyeurism come into it. Americans were encouraged to look and spy on their neighbors. This is what the government wanted to do, and they didn't really care if they had evidence or not. HUAC was set up, the House of Un-American Activities, and it targeted particularly Hollywood and the arts industry. They questioned, even tortured individuals, forcing them to name names of those who they believed were, as I said before, either communist or communist sympathizers. And the reason why they targeted these aspects is because, well, these were the individuals that were questioning the government over their motives and their motivations and their reasons behind doing what they were doing. We know, of course, from our reading of The Crucible that Arthur Miller, who was staunchly against the government, um, was actually questioned a couple of years after writing The Crucible um, by HUAC. And many other famous individuals were as well. Let's take a little look at gender roles now as well. And we know that prior to World War II, that women were predominantly restricted to domestic duties. That is, they were sort of housebound. Following the war though, when, as I mentioned previously, they played a significant role in the war efforts and, and working, um, there was an increase in, in the workforce and they found more independence and freedom, both socially but also financially. And no longer was the man necessarily considered the breadwinner. Women had the opportunity to work. And Jeffrey's and Lee's relationship really explores the complexities of gender expectations where it was considered that men would go out to work all day while women would stay at home, or I should say husbands and wives, more so to, to the point. We know particularly that marriage was seen as something that was quite restricting, not just for women, but also for men. And something that I'd like you to consider is whether we see a role reversal in Jeffrey's and Lee's relationship, with Jeffrey's being housebound in his wheelchair, and Lisa going out to work. Yet again, um, we also see Lisa preparing dinner for Jeff. We see Lisa's preoccupation with marriage and wanting to settle down, um, and Jeffrey's reluctance for this as well. So we definitely see these gender roles, I guess, promoted, but also challenged at the same time by Hitchcock through these protagonists, but also through other characters as well. Obviously, the Thorwald's depiction is one of marriage as being quite suffocating and we see the newlyweds of one being quite traditional and we'll go on go into that in more detail a little bit later on but for me the key takeouts of today is to firstly encourage you to undertake further research on the context this was just a brief outline or overview of the key information that i think you need to know but there's so much more you could definitely look at and then reference, of course, in your essays. I'd also encourage you to watch the film as many times as possible, to the extent that hopefully you know most of the quotations, which leads me on to the next point about creating a quotation bank based on the key themes and the key ideas as well. My last point is definitely to consider those next level examples. Think about film techniques, 
Think about symbols. Think about the context information because this can all be used in your essays and in your written responses to showcase a more detailed and high level of thinking when it comes to the texts. Thanks for your company today. I look forward to seeing you next time on the 6Ps podcast.